you, uh, Pastor John. Thank you, praise team. Well, welcome to the house of the Lord today. How you doing? All right, yeah, you guys sound alive, sound good. What a blessing it is to be together today. Thank you for joining us online as well. We love having you there as uh, being part of what we're doing today and celebrating the Lord. Well, I have to start out today with a bit of an apology. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but last Thursday, uh, May 2nd, was the National Day of Prayer. How many people knew that? A few, a few of you. Uh, really, I, I, as um, believers in a country that has a, pray, a, a day literally set aside for prayer, I feel bad. I did not let you guys know. I, I was invited to a prayer breakfast, and I went to that, and there's a couple things on the prayer table that help us, uh, some prayer cards that help, will help you pray, specifically on how to pray for our nation, and uh, Lord, we need all the prayer we can get, for sure. So just wanted to kind of read that next year. Uh, well, I'm going to be a little more on top of that. Hopefully we'll be more involved. Uh, we're actually hoping to have a much larger um, uh, prayer breakfast that took place in our association. So uh, excited about that for next year. But So I, I've gotten wind that uh, we have shared and people have asked a little bit about the fact that John Mitchell and I uh, did a triathlon last Saturday. And so if you don't know what a triathlon is, that's a, a three-sport event. Basically, you swim, you bike, and you run. And doing all three of those things, you have to train quite a bit. You know, you can't just train to be a runner, just can't train to be a swimmer. You've got to train for all three of those things. So, you know, I get up early in the morning and train. John's retired. He gets up when he wants to and <laughs> trains when he wants to. Um, but you have to put a lot of effort into doing this. And, and there are different levels, and we're smart because we just do the, the smallest level. So we, we bike, it, or we, we swim a half a mile, we uh, bike about 16 miles, and we run a 5K, which is 3.1 miles, just short of 20 miles. So it's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> because the other ones are a total of 146.2 miles if you do the big one, but we don't do that. So, you know, we, we, we trained for this. We got to give our all to this. And so I, I, we had a picture right before the race last Saturday. Can we show it? Look, at, look, don't we look good? We're, we're ready to go. We're, we're smiling. And, and then after we gave our all, we look like this. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we look a lot better than we felt. <laughs> well, the point is this, folks. <clears throat> Our sermon today is entitled, Our All, and our all has a lot more to do than just swimming and biking and running. It's a lot more, and we're going to talk about that today. We're going to see that in our text today, and so you do see our sermon today is coming from chapter 20 out of the, bur the, uh, out of the book of Luke, and also a little bit out of 21. Let me just pray as we get ready to go into the message. Father God, thank you so much for, again, this incredible account of Jesus' life through this non-Jewish person, this Gentile, Luke, who has placed things just amazingly in this account of your life. Lord, we're so grateful for these words, and as we go into them and we hear about what you did some 2,000 years ago and how it has impacted us personally and in the world, Lord, let us glean from you what it is you want us to learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to pick up right where Pastor Mitch left off last week. If you recall last week, Jesus was deflecting some questions about his authority, and he was teaching about uh, rejecting the cornerstone. The cornerstone, of course, was Jesus uh, he was telling parable about that, the leaders, essentially, that, uh, again, he, Jesus being the cornerstone. And if you remember, he said that they would be crushed, uh, the people that didn't follow the cornerstone, if you will. I love what the New King James Version says. It says they would be grounded into powder. Oof. So uh, Pastor Mitch rightfully told us, hey, we need to be in alignment, okay, of, with the cornerstone, with Jesus, and live a life in that way. And so thank you, Pastor John, for challenging us that way. 
But let me give you, the, I guess, the bigger picture if you haven't been with us for a while. Again, this is the end of Jesus' ministry. This is Jesus going to Jerusalem, knowing that the cross lays before him. He does what he was supposed to do. He fulfills prophecy, and he rides into Jerusalem on that Sunday, we call it Palm Sunday, on a donkey. As he approaches the city and he comes down the mountain, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept. He wasn't weeping for himself, but he was weeping about the prophecy he was just about to say, which we believe is what took place in A.D. 70 when the Romans ransacked the city and killed thousands of Jewish people. He cried and wept over that. What's interesting is that that Attack by the Romans back in AD 70 was actually about taxation. (laughs) And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today in our message. Jesus gets to the city, and if you remember, he cleanses the temple. This is a house of prayer. Get out of here. Kicks over the tables and the money changers and all those things. And then after that outburst, Jesus doesn't go into hiding He goes back into the temple and starts teaching. Matthew's gospel said he starts healing people. And the religious leaders were absolutely furious because the crowds loved him and they couldn't get to him. And so the scribes and the Pharisees, the priests, would send leaders in there to to get Jesus to say something that that they could at least get part of the crowd to, to go against him so they could arrest him without incident. So that's where we are. Let's pick up there in chapter 20, verse 19. They sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, about the cornerstone, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authorities or the jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality, but truly teach the ways of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Hmm. But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but they marveled at his answer and became silent. Let me jump into chapter 21 real fast. It's basically the same scene, so the the scenario of things that are before that are in sequence, but it's the same situation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, and he said, truly, I say to you, this poor woman has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. May God bless the reading of his word. In this text, Jesus addresses in particular two what I would call complementary obligations. They're complementary because Jesus basically teaches that we are to be obedient to both of these things. The first one is an earthy obligation to pay government taxes. We're all familiar with this. April 15th is, you know, in a rearview mirror, rear mirror for some of us. You can see it. For those of you who went on extension, it's in front of you still, right? <laughs> but there's that godly obligation, but there's a second godly obligation. That is the obligation to give God, give to God what is rightfully His. And we'll come back to both those obligations more in the application section. But I, I want us to understand exactly, exactly, thank you, uh, what this encounter was going on, what was taking place in this encounter. So let me help you understand what these religious leaders were trying to do specifically with their questions. 
we know that they were trying to get Jesus to say something essentially heretical, if you will, so the leaders could arrest him without incident. They tried in the last sermon that Pastor John preached there. Uh, now they're essentially trying again. And, and this time they really think they have the right question. They're, they really think they can trick him. And so it, 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 let's look at the question they came up with. And it said in verses 21, 22, So they asked the teacher, We know you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful? For us to give tribute or pay taxes to Caesar or not. Now, I, if, 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 I love what it said just before that. It said they, they sent in spies. And so literally, the, the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they literally found other men that, that, that Jesus didn't know who they were, didn't know that they were you know, scribes or Pharisees. They hadn't seen them before, so they picked these other guys out, and they coached these guys to butter up Jesus. Oh, you teach so rightly. You're teaching the ways of God, and, and as if they're going to trick Jesus. I, I thought, wow, what idiots. <laughs> but I thought about that too, and I was like, do, do we ever kind of do that? Do, do we ever try to just be nice to God in such a way that we ignore the things that we know that we're doing wrong to the point where we don't even confess them or think about them or acknowledge them in any way, shape, or form, and we just kind of give God all our, all our good stuff, sometimes we might be guilty of the same thing. The question being asked basically is this, as a Jew, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? This time, though, they, they thought they had Jesus. They, they really thought, you know, hey, they missed it with the John the Baptist question and the authority question, but this time now we have him. So no matter what Jesus says, we're going to get him. We're, they're, they're thinking, all right, we got Jesus cornered here, literally. And if you didn't know, Jerusalem and much <laughs> extended uh, surrounding areas are under Roman control at this time. Okay, the top man is Caesar, who's based out of, out of Rome. Uh, another helpful hint for us to understand in this whole situation, it comes out of Mark's gospel, and you understand that there's two different groups of people in the crowd. There are the Pharisees and what are called the Herodians. Now, these two groups literally hate each other, but they are in united <laughs> front in a united front against Jesus because they both hate Jesus. So they're essentially kind of willing to work together, if you will. But really there was three groups because there was uh, a, the crowd that could lean either way. They could lean towards the Pharisees and the way they think, or they could lean towards the Herodians the way they think. But let me under, help you understand how the Herodians think because these were Jewish people, but they essentially were in league with the Romans, okay? They... they, they they hated Jesus because they saw Jesus as a threat to the Roman authority. But these were Jews that would, were okay with Rome and all they did for them. And Rome, did, Rome built their temple back. And so, but there was a group of them, uh, the, the, the Pharisees on the other side, they hated Jesus for another reason. They hated Jesus because they were, Jesus was a threat to their religious way of life. And so both those people are kind of in the crowd, and there's this in-between group, essentially, in the crowd. And so they figure if they can sway the crowd one way or the other, they got Jesus, and they can essentially arrest him without incident. So if Jesus answers in such a way to support Rome and say, pay your taxes, be a good Roman citizen, even though you're Jewish, all right, then he would get the, the, the Pharisees would have sympathizers, and those people would turn on him. Now, if he answered and said, don't pay your taxes, the Herodians and their supporters would turn on Jesus because now he's, a, he's rebelling. And so you see, they're trying to pray the crowd against Jesus so they can get to him. And I, I love what it says there. It says, but he perceived their craftiness. <laughs> As if these guys were going to outwit the Son of God. <laughs> Silly men. 
The question, though, was actually a very good question because taxes were a social and a political hot button. It, it, it was like abortion today is in our culture, if not even more so tension. These tensions and emotions were extremely high on the issue of taxes during Jesus' time. And the Jews were taxed for a lot of stuff. They were taxed on top of their tax. I mean, it was crazy all the things that these people were taxed about. Plus, they had to give their religious offerings as well. And, and, and they had those Jewish tax collectors like Zacchaeus that were, you know, the way the system was set up, they could essentially tax anything they wanted to. And so it was, it was a bad system. It was a bad thing. But essentially, it, it kind of reminded me of back a few years back, I think it was right when the, we had the floods in, in Ellicott City and Maryland tried to tax us on our rain. <laughs> Remember the rain tax they tried to push through? But luckily, our political system worked, and they didn't get that passed. So, but the truth is, there's, there are good reasons for the government to tax us. They provide services. Did, did you know that the Romans actually created over 55,000 miles of roadways? That's where their, a lot of their taxes went to, was building these roadways. Took them 700 years, and some of those roads still exist today. My question is, why do we have to repave 100 every two years? <laughs> Just saying. But again, the, the idea, the, the, the government does provide. They provided a roadway for commerce and all those things, and so it's, it was a good thing. How about the, what's considered or what's called the Pax Romano? The Pax Romano essentially is called the, is the peace of Rome. Essentially, Judea, the Jerusalem area and all these other areas that they were in charge of, nobody was going to go against them because they, uh, they offered them a peace into civilization and, and, and that kind of thing. So there were some good things. So paying taxes has been a large part, actually, of, of every large society in the world. Now, Jesus not only answers brilliantly and essentially shuts him up, his answer is theologically insightful, and I think it's challenging to you and I. So let's look at his answer, verses 24 and 25. He says, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and description does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render to Caesar what the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So literally, he just asked somebody to pull out a denarius, okay? A denarius essentially was a coin that represented a one day's laborer's work. And so I think we have a picture of it. Do we have a picture of it up there? Yep, there it is. That, that's literally the coin that Jesus would have been looking at. That's Tiberius Caesar there. That's what it looked like. And he pulls it out there and it has Tiberius Caesar's picture on it. One thing you need to remember, though, for a, a Jewish person, and not all Jews felt this way, but certainly the very strict ones, there's an image on there, right? You see the picture. Um, they would, they, many of the Jewish people thought because it had an image like that, it was a, a uh, breaking the second commandment of worshiping an image. And so they literally thought, well, the, the, the money these guys give us are making us... Uh, you know, violate the second commandment. And, and so, for some of them, this was, a, this was a big deal, okay? So, again, he asks, what image is on there? It's Tiberius Caesar, rendered to Caesar's what is Caesar. To be quite honest, that's just good logic, isn't it? It's his picture. Give it to him. Makes sense to me. But I believe that Jesus was actually teaching more than that. Rome, he's, he's basically saying, look, Rome is in charge here. It's right to, to be taxed, the political thing. It's this, this is the way it is. The government has this right, and you need to follow it. And the truth is that New Testament Scripture supports that very thought. Let's look at a couple of them. Out of Romans chapter 13, it's actually verses 1 through 7, but we'll just look at the first two. It says, every person be subject to the governing authorities, 
For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists these authorities resists God, what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, a few verses later, he actually mentions taxes in that section. But let's also look at what the Apostle Peter says about it, because he mentions it also. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. I want you to notice that caveat at the end, because that's a very important caveat. To punish evil and to praise or reward what is good. And if you actually read in the rest of chapter 13, that same caveat is in that section as well. And we're going to come back to that, and, and again, in our application. But I want you to think just for a moment. We, we all have heard this, and, and, and we know this saying. It's a soundbite, if you will, of Jesus to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, render to God the things that are God. So you hear people say that in the secular world. You hear it out there. It's, it's literally a soundbite of Jesus. Some people don't know that. But this statement is, is, what I just, is basically what I just read in, in Second, First Peter and, and Romans 13. And these verses, essentially, of Scripture have shaped Western civilization, if you think about it. The implications in Christ's teaching is that the state has a, as is a valid institution. Our government is a valid institution. I want to read a quote from a past chaplain from the United States Senate. His name is Richard Havelson, but it's not on the screen, but just, just listen carefully to what he writes. He says, To be sure, men will abuse and misuse the institution of the state just as men, because of sin, they have abused and misused every other institution in the history, including the church of Jesus Christ. But this does not mean that the institution is bad or that it should be forsaken. It simply means that men are sinners and rebel in God's world. And this is the way they have behaved with good institutions. As a matter of fact, it is because of this very sin that there must be a human government to maintain order in history until the final and ultimate rule of Jesus Christ is established. established. Human government is better than anarchy, and the Christian must recognize the divine right of the state. Now, I, I, to be honest, I don't think there's too many Christian people that take issue with that. We believe that. We live under that. We, we like a lot of the stuff that, that we get because we pay taxes. But it is important to know that that system actually is underwritten by Jesus himself, by Scripture. So there's a couple things I want us to kind of take away or learn from this, and it's in your notes, and um, uh, we'll just follow along here. It says, God knows and puts governments in place, both good and bad. Every government that's in place, God knows. God's in charge. He knows the good ones and the bad ones. Governments and their, te- and their leaders should punish evil and promote what is good. That is the call of every government, is to punish evil and promote what is good. We are commanded to follow such governments. The great challenge for us today, folks, is... The definition of good and evil is drastically changing in our culture. It makes it really hard and challenging for the Christian today. Some of the questions maybe that are popping into your mind based on what I just shared, I think the big one might be this. Is there a time when God's people disobey the government? Is there ever a time in our life where we're supposed to disobey the government? The answer is yes. Okay? And think about it in history, what we've seen taking place. It was one of the trivia questions last night about uh, the sit-ins that the, the four uh, African-Americans did in North Carolina back in the 60s and, 
and sitting in that restaurant and defying the rule of the government there. We see it in what took place a few years back where there was a a family that had a bakery and they weren't going to provide the cake for a homosexual wedding. I mean, you can look at the uh, the American Revolution and the taxation with that representation and the abuse the, the British people were putting on the government, but that, that goes to another level of not just disobeying the government, but essentially starting a war, okay? We saw that, again, take place certainly in our own country with the Civil War. I mean, we saw it also in World War II and the way the, the Nazis were annihilating the Jews and what took place. In all of those cases, evil was being praised and good was being stopped. Now, in the extreme cases, situations, Christians had to, ab- to disobey the government to the point of war. And, and, and just make sure, I, what I just read and what I'm going to talk about, that's, another, that's a different question than just disobeying the government, if you will. And so as I did some research on this, thought about this, prayed about this, read several different places, um, I, I, I came up with a copulation of three different reasons, three biblical reasons why we would disobey the government. And it's all really based upon what we read in Scripture, specifically in Acts chapter 5, when Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. Why did they say that? In that particular situation, they, they were called by God, they were commanded by God to preach the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus, and that's what they did. They went into the temple and did it, and they were arrested for it. God ultimately protected them in their situation, but that's not always what takes place. So, three biblical reasons to disobey the government. A Christian must resist when asked to violate a command of God. So if God literally does command us to do something, and the government says we can't, well, we should. It's interesting, at the prayer breakfast I was at the other day, there was a police officer there. He was the main speaker there, and he was actually a resource officer in the, the schools here in Howard County. And he keeps a Bible on his desk. And he has his, in his breaks, he takes very diligently, he takes his Bible time and his reading very seriously. But with that Bible on that desk, he has had opportunity to literally share the gospel. Now that's a case where you're actually doing what God calls you to do with and you're not actually having to break the law. Because you can do that. The law has it set up. There's no reason why you can't have a Bible on your desk. And so, again, we need, we need to think through these things as we, we look at them. So that's the first one. The second one says this, Christian must resist when asked to do an act that is immoral. And, and, and so if you are asked at work or through, maybe you work for the government and they're telling you to fudge some numbers because we got a big agenda, you got to say no. An immoral act, to lie. Number three, believers must go or or must never go against their Christian conscience to obey the government. There is a sense of consciousness that that we have that that brings things into question because of what we believe. And this this affects everything, essentially. There could be issues in entertainment, there should be work things, there could be uh, issues or, or, or conscience about abortion and participating in different things and and all those type of things. You have a conscience that God calls you to follow. So three reasons why a Christian may need to resist or go against the government, those are three good reasons, I believe. But you also know, you must know, that if you do that, there's a good chance there will be consequences. And the government has a right to put through the consequences. Luckily, we live in a democracy (laughs) where we can try to change things. And so, you know, this is interesting in the Christian world. Some of you know this or not, but, you know, some people are of the ilk that, you know what? You're a Christian, 
keep it the gospel, don't ever get involved with politics and, or anything like that with the government or whatever, whatever. Uh, folks, we fortunately have a government where we can influence <laughs> and still have that opportunity. And I don't see why we wouldn't. Now, our main purpose always is, to, is, is the gospel and, and getting people saved. But if we have a voice, shouldn't we be using it? And we look at our life today. I don't, I don't know as, as Christians. I've challenged myself. Are we using our voice properly and enough? Just something to think and pray about. But that's not all what Jesus said, right? He, he didn't say just about Caesar. He did about paying taxes. He said more. He said, and to God, the things that are God. That's the second obligation that Jesus puts forth there. Jesus is brilliant, and he adds this last part because it smashes the religious leaders' hopes that they were going to be able to turn the crowd. If he had just left it at the one, the religious leaders would have been thrilled. But no, he didn't just leave it there. He said, render the things that are God to God that are God's. So Jesus lets everyone know that we essentially have a government obligation, but also we have an obligation, a religious obligation, to follow through with what God has called us to do. The issue, these guys should have seen this, <laughs> but they didn't. With this simple but tyrant, timeless answer, Jesus stuns these men silent by what he says. But it is that, it is that last section that give to God the things that are God's that I want to kind of hang my hat on and spend a little time with. Because this begs an obvious question, really, I think. What are the things of God? Or better maybe said this way, what are the things we are to give back to God that belong to Him? And so I'll, answer, I'll ask the question this way. What have we been given as followers of Christ? What have we been given as followers of Christ? We have been given, folks, new life. <laughs> we have been given new life in Christ. Look, look up at a couple verses. I love this. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For God gives us new life. We are born again, the Bible tells us, spiritually, literally born spiritually. Look what it says to the Ephesians, Paul says to the Ephesian church, he says, to put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life that is corrupted through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. We, as followers of Christ, actually are being built up in the likeness, in the image, just like that coin <laughs> bared the image of Tiberius, Caesar. We are being built up and are the image of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to what he says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, and as is the man of heaven, so also are those are of heaven. Just as we have bore the image of the man of dust, essentially Adam, mankind, we also shall bear the image of the man of heaven. <laughs> we are born again. We are born new. We have new life. And we have the image of Christ. Amen? Yeah. So... What are we to give back to him? Our all. All of it. <laughs> we are born in his image. We are given his likeness. And he wants it all back, essentially. We are to release our hearts, not parts of our hearts, but all of our hearts. That's our mission statement. Release our hearts to God. In Paul's letter to the Roman church, he transitions from his theology to his practical application in chapter 12. 
He does this in all his letters, actually. In chapter 12 in the book of Romans is when he makes the switch. And this switch is really powerful when it comes to practical application. Listen to what he writes there in the beginning of, of chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers or brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This passage is several sermons in and of itself, but let me just highlight a section of it. He says, present your bodies. He's not saying just present your eyes or your mind or your hands or your feet. He says, present your bodies, all of you, are a sacrifice to God, which ultimately means for us, folks, that Jesus speaks into every aspect of our life. He speaks into our relationships. He speaks into our money. He speaks into our marriage. He speaks into our sexuality. He speaks into our work. He speaks into our school. He speaks into our entertainment. He speaks into our hobbies. He speaks into our travel. He speaks into our family. He speaks into everything. He has authority over all of these things. God's truth is to speak to every aspect of our lives. We're to give it all. So when we're making a decision about our life, we can ask a question. This is a good question to ask when you're trying to find out, should I or shouldn't I? Maybe. Do these things help or hinder the mission that God has given me? Do these things help or hinder the mission to go spread the good news and be a disciple? Should I go in and do this with my friends, which I know probably you shouldn't do, but you know, or should I do something else? Even the simplest things we should put under essentially the microscope or authority of God when we give it all to him. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine the other day, and he was telling me that he's been studying jiu-jitsu for the last year or so, and he, he really likes it. It's, 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 I don't know, I, he talked a lot about it, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. It's very different than karate and other things, um, and, and it's a huge, huge commitment, and it's a huge commitment time-wise and, and, and um, financially that you have to do if you're going to be trained by somebody to, to learn this. And, you know, he had to scratch his head. He, he had to go back and look at his life. He's called to be a pastor, uh, and he had to evaluate. And I think he, I can't remember where he landed, or, or I, I know he's maybe he's still evaluating it, but he's like, I really have to, to step back and say, hey, is this really helping me in the mission that God has given me? And that's not just for pastors. And, and to be quite honest, I, I, I think about it often even with the triathlon stuff. Is this what I'm spending time-wise and money-wise? Is this helping or hindering or is it just kind of neutral? So it was interesting. I was talking to one of the guys at the triathlon and I was like, oh, how many do you do? Oh, I do one like two or three times, you know, two or three a month. I'm like, man, <laughs> I do like two a year maybe. <laughs> uh, but you know, things can, can kind of get in, out of control sometimes. And we need to ask that question. And we were giving our all to Christ. If we were making our bodies a living sacrifice to Him, it, it begs that we need to question, is this helping or hindering? And sometimes the answer is clearly yes or no. Sometimes it's like neutral. And for me, like for triathlons, to be quite honest, if I don't exercise, I feel horrible long term, and I become very ineffective. So I'm just one of those people, God made me to, to, to move, <laughs> and so I got to make sure I keep moving. But the bottom line is, we're new creatures in Christ, and we're His. We're His. Now, if you call, again, I added a, a, a second scripture from the next chapter, 
And the reason is, like I told you, this is actually the same continuing situation that has taken place. And so there are some questions or things that Jesus addresses about the resurrection that we'll handle next week. Um, but then Jesus adds and says this, and then the, the scene in the, ends up coming to a close, if you will. And he says this, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I said to you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty and all she had to live on, she gave it all. She gave it all. And, and I really think Jesus was bringing home the point of what he said in the last part of that soundbite. Render to God the things that are God's. And that when he said that, he is talking about giving it our all whatever that might be. At best, it's loosely connected for sure, but I really think he was trying to bring home what it really means to walk with him. So what we have, it's all God's. He's given us new life, and he wants all of our heart. And the question to you today is, is, is twofold. Number one, have you even given your heart to Christ? If you're here and you've never expected Jesus as your Savior because he did die for you, he rose from the dead, and he will call us home to be his. If we believe, we will be accepted into his family. We will begin to bear his image. That's the first question. If you've never done that, I encourage you, if you're watching or hearing online, I encourage you to ask Jesus to be your Savior. You've sinned, you've fallen short of his glory. Ask him for forgiveness. Trust him for what he did on the cross. He can be your savior. He can give you new life. Or maybe you're here today and it's just a, a situation where maybe I'm not all in. I'm not giving God my all. Maybe there's some area of your heart that you've been holding back that God is speaking to you about. And he wants to, you to give that back to him today. And I would just ask you as we sing, as we pray, and you would just do that, that you'd listen to God and that you'd follow him. Let me just pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for this particular passage where we learn that you have called us completely for our all. You don't want part of our hearts. You want all of our hearts. Every bit and piece of our heart. And Lord, where we've been holding back, Father, let us release that to you today. And Lord, if there's someone here that hasn't, is holding on to their sin, trying to think their good deeds can take them away, Father, let them release those to you. Let them ask for forgiveness for you, knowing that your sacrifice was their punishment and that because of your love, you have offered them salvation and eternal life and new life even today. Lord, let us continue just to do business with you as we leave this place today, as we continue to praise you throughout this week. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We pray in the blessed name of Jesus and the church says, amen, amen. In my closing, just remember, folks, Caesar has a right to your taxes, but God has a right to your worship, all right? Caesar has a right to your revenue, but God has a right to your reverence. Give a portion of your money to Caesar, but give everything you are to God. Give it all to you. Let's sing about that today. Mm -hmm.